later on. So, let's turn in our Bibles to Exodus chapter 39. <clears throat> You'll notice I've missed a, a big chunk out. That is deliberate. Uh, but uh, let's turn to God's Word. Verse 32. Verse 32. So all the work on the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, was completed. The Israelites did everything just as the Lord commanded Moses. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its furnishings, its clasps, frames, crossbars, posts and bases, the covering of ramskins dyed red, and the covering of another durable leather, and the shielding curtain, the ark of the covenant law with its poles, and the atonement cover, the table with all its articles, and the bread of presents, the pure gold, Sorry, the pure gold lampstand with its row of lamps and all its accessories and the olive oil for the light. The gold altar, the anointing oil, the fragrant incense and the curtain for the entrance to the tent. The bronze altar with its bronze grating, its poles and all its utensils. The basin with its stand, the curtains of the courtyard with its posts and bases and the curtain for the entrance to the courtyard the ropes and tent pegs for the courtyard, all the furnishings for the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and the woven garments worn for ministering in the sanctuary, both the sacred garments for Aaron the priest and the garments for his sons when serving as priests. The Israelites had done all the work just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Moses inspected the work and saw that they had done it just as the Lord had commanded. So Moses blessed them. <clears throat> now I think we're all familiar with being inspected in one way or another. If and when you children, if and when you children go back to school... <laughs> You'll once again know what it's like to be scrutinised and marked and inspected by your teacher. You'll have to get familiar to, uh, with taking tests and examinations once again. Now, if you're a teacher or a member of a professional body, then you'll know what it is to be inspected also. You may have an audit, an Ofsted inspection, or you may even be interviewed by your peers. Inspections are an everyday part of life and they come in uh, many different ways and from many different directions and we have them to see whether or not we meet the standard. All right, A standard has been set and the inspection makes sure we meet that standard. Now in this morning's passage that we've just read, we've seen that Moses is inspecting all the work that had been done in the building of the tent of meeting and the tabernacle. Moses is looking at what's been made. This is the whole point of this section at the end of chapter 39. And when Moses comes, he's not uh, inspecting things for himself, but he's coming on behalf of God. Now, in previous weeks, we've learned that uh, Moses has been representing the Israelites before God. Moses is a mediator, all right? He, becomes, he comes between two uh, opposing people, all right? He comes, or opposing bodies, all right? He's the one who stands between the people and God. And we've read on numerous occasions that Moses goes before God to represent the people, but he is now representing God. He's God's representative. He's not a government inspector. All right. He's not an Ofsted inspector. He's God's inspector. He's been appointed by God to inspect what the people have done. Now, Moses is in a privileged position because he, he heard firsthand these instructions. So he's in a, in a, in a good place. He knows the details, he knows the instructions that God has given, and he knows what to look for. And it's important that Moses does inspect what these people have made, because this tent that these people have been involved in is a place where God 
is going to dwell. Now Moses isn't just inspecting the tent, he's also inspecting everything that's going to go inside this tent. He's also going to be inspecting the furniture and also the special clothes that the priests were going to wear. What Aaron, that's the brother of Moses, was going to wear and his sons. And the priests were, uh, were in a very privileged position because they ministered before God. And these priests couldn't just turn up in their shepherd suit or their wilderness, uh, wilderness clothing. They had to wear these special, this special uniform before God. So Moses, all right, is now scrutinizing, all right, he's inspecting the canvas that will cover this special tent. He's inspecting the stitching uh, that surrounds the, the curtains that go round the courtyard so that uh, there's this uh, demarcation of where this tabernacle is. He brushes his hand over the, the special heavy ornate, 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 ornate curtains that separate the, the holy place from the most holy place. He inspects this special box called the Ark of the Covenant. He looks at it, he sees if it's the right measurements, the right proportions. He looks at the mercy seat with the cherubim. This is the place where God would show his mercy and the forgiveness of sins. He inspects the joints on this special table that's covered with gold where the bread would be displayed so that the people would understand that it's God who provides for their every need. He inspects that special lampstand which, made, which, which is made of gold. It makes sure that it's, it, it, it's crafted perfectly, that it's good craftsmanship. And this candle, this lampstand, this golden lampstand would symbolise the light and life of God. And then he cast his eyes over the golden altar that would be the place where the burnt fragrant on incense would be, would be burnt to symbolize the prayers of his people. And then that special bronze altar that was five cubits by five cubits and three cubits high. And this was where all the animals would be sacrificed. And then there's the bronze basin where the priest would wash. Then there's the ephod, the breastpiece, the robe and the turban for Aaron. Moses had a lot of inspecting to do. I can remember as a child when the inspector used to come round uh, at school. It was a terrifying occasion. The, the, the teacher would warn us. There was the riot act. It was threat after threat after threat. And one of the things I can remember about, uh, about the inspector coming was their clipboard. They always had a clipboard. And for some reason when I read this passage here in, at the end of Exodus, it says, oh, Moses has a clipboard. He doesn't, by the way, all right? I'm sure he doesn't. But you can imagine it, can't you? Moses is just looking at everything the people have made and he's assessing it, inspecting it, making sure it meets God's standard. Now, he had to do this because this, this tabernacle, this special tent of meeting, was going to be a daily reminder as it was there erected in the centre of the Israelite community that uh, God is great and that he's holy and that also he's full of mystery. We don't know everything about God. It was also going to show them that they needed to put God at the centre of their lives and that the atonement for sin had to be made. It was going to be a constant, daily weekly reminder that without the shedding of blood there would be no remission of sins but the thing that this tent was going to teach them the most or prepare them for the most was the coming of Jesus this is what this tent and everything that was in the tent and those who ministered in the tent this is what the tent was all about now the Israelites wouldn't have understood that fully at the time but the Jewish people, all right, as they grew in their knowledge of Christ and believed in him for salvation, they would begin to understand this. And we today understand this. Everything about this tent speaks of Jesus Christ. It tells us something about him. And this is why my friend Peter 
I was telling you about earlier as he read through Leviticus, was get, got so excited about Leviticus because he knew, he realised, he understood. He read a great big thick commentary, by the way. But he understood it's all about Jesus Christ. So I want you to picture it. Moses goes and scrutinises the work. He looks at everything. He misses nothing out because he knows God is going to dwell in this tent. Now, when we read about the building of the tabernacle from the middle of chapter 36 right through to chapter 39, let's be honest, it's one of those parts of the Bible that can be <laughs> very tedious and very hard work. All right, I am embarrassed to say that when it comes to this part of the Bible that I read in my quiet time, I don't jump for joy. But I should be jumping for joy. I don't, you don't very often hear of Christians saying, well, I've read the end of Exodus and uh, the Lord's really blessed me with this verse. All right, It's not one of those parts of the Bible that we jump up about and uh, remember. It's one of those passages where we kind of, uh, we go a little bit fast, all right? We, we, we up the pace, all right? These chapters are heavy and they can easily make our eyelids feel heavy. So if you're a young Christian, all right, and this is the reason why I mentioned this, if you're a young Christian, don't be discouraged if you find these chapters at the end of Exodus a little difficult and even hard, all right? They're not easy, they're difficult. But over time, as you read them more often, as you hear God's word, as you become familiar with the Old Testament, and even with the book of Hebrews, they become a rich source of encouragement. All right, a rich source of encouragement. So if you're a young Christian, don't be discouraged about all that you read at the end of the book of Exodus. Now, we've said it before, and I want to repeat it. These latter chapters are repeating what's been said in chapters 25 to 31. In chapters 25 to 31, Moses is up Mount Sinai and God is giving the instructions to Moses of how he wanted to be worshipped. Now in these latter chapters, it's as though everything in chapters 25 to 31 is being repeated. It's as though it's word for word. And they're being repeated because the people are now doing exactly what God asked them to do. And this is why Moses repeats it. All right, It's because they're doing what God had asked them to do. And this is how we're to read these chapters. We're to say, wow, wow, they're doing what God said. And when anybody does what God said, there should be this wow factor because we see that it is actually the grace of God at work. Now when we read verses 32, we read something very interesting, verse 32 of chapter 39. Because what we read is that the people did everything just as the Lord commanded Moses. In verse 42 we also read that the Israelites had done all the work just as the Lord had commanded Moses. In fact, in chapter 39, we'll notice that the phrase, as the Lord commanded Moses, is repeated eight times. Now, you're all counting, you're all wondering your eyes over the chapter, if I've got it right. I've double-checked and checked. I'm sure it's eight, and I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong. But it could be nine if we, if we just include, as the Lord commanded now, if the Bible says something once, then it's enough for us to take notice of, all right? And cause us to sit up and listen. If it just says it once. However, if the Bible said something eight times, or even nine times, then we know God is emphasising something. However, if God says something eight or nine times in one chapter, then surely we're understanding and we're getting the message. This is as though God is shouting at us. He's telling us, these people did as I had commanded. It's as though he's shouting at us. These people were being totally and absolutely devoted to the commands of God. Now, what do we learn from this? 
What can we learn from the Israelites doing everything that the Lord had commanded Moses? Well, there are several things, and I've, I've streamlined it, I've, I've shortened it, so don't be afraid. But there are many things that we can learn. One of the things that we learn is that God is the one who tells us how he wants to be worshipped. He prescribes what we're to do. He tells us, he commands us, he instructs us what we're to do when we come together and worship him. You say, God is so gracious to us, he doesn't say, right, elders, you think of a way how you can please me when you gather as a church. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Elders and church leaders, synods, and even if we're, even if we have a church meeting, we're not the ones to come up with inventions to say, right, this is what we're going to do. It's God who prescribes what we do when we worship Him. Now, one of the things that you've noticed as we come uh, and do our services online is that we choose two hymns. And it's not easy, you know. <laughs> we know we've made some mistakes and we've chosen some right, uh, well, some, <laughs> bad yeah, bad videos, good hymns, but bad videos, all right? It happens to us all and please be gracious to us because it's not very easy at all. But one of the things I've noticed in choosing hymns, having to go through lots and lots of YouTube clips, is that there are some meetings, some church services where you see an artist, all right? with an easel and a canvas, and they're painting a picture. I don't know if you've seen it, Steve. No, no. Oh, I, once or twice I've come, and I've been mesmerised, all right? And they're doing it because they're worshipping God. Now, being an artist is a legitimate calling. God's not against Christians being artists. If you're a good artist, God wants you to use your talents for his glory. God is not against Christians being artists, all right, being painters, being drawers, being musicians. But neither is against us being an engineer if God's given us those uh, gifts for maths and calculations and organisation. Then we can legitimately, legitimately be an engineer, like a teacher or a mum or a, a house. There are many things that God legitimately calls us to do. He wants us to use our work for his glory. When we use it for his glory, we're worshipping him. But being an artist or an engineer and doing our craft and our skill in a worship service is not the thing that God has prescribed for us to do when we gather for corporate worship. Now, I'm, I'm taking the extreme, but I hope you're understanding what's being said. The Bible doesn't say that when we meet for corporate worship, we, we get out an easel and we put a piece of canvas on it. And then while we're singing, how great thou art, we're also drawing a picture or painting. Neither does it say that we, we get out our computer and we do our calculations and we, re, we write a report for a client. You see, God has told us how he wants to be worshipped when we come together. Now, some of you will know this, but for those of you who, who don't, it's called the regulative principle of worship, which simply means God's given us the regulations to follow or the instructions to follow how he wants to be worshipped. He gives us instructions in the Bible of what we're to do when we gather together. Now, there are many examples in the Bible of worship being regulated. If, that's, if you find it's been offensive to you that God actually regulates what we're to do, well, there are many examples in the Bible where worship to God is regulated. Think of Cain and Abel. Think of them. One did it right, one did it wrong. Think of the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. They were consumed because they didn't worship God how God wanted to be worshipped. They offered strange fire. Think of King Saul. What did King Saul do? Oh, I'll just, I'll just go along with this sacrifice. I'll just sacrifice to God. And he was rejected as king. Think of the New Testament, the Corinthians. The Corinthian church was being consumed by people who just wanted to speak in tongues. And Paul has to correct them. He has to bring 
order, instruction, regulation. Because Paul tells them they needed to have an interpreter. Now the New Testament tells gospel churches, tells churches like ourselves what we're to do when we come together. It's not left to our imaginations or this is a good idea or why don't we do that? In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, we're instructed to, to sing psalms as well as hymns and spiritual songs. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13 tells us to read the Bible. Boys and girls, that's why we read the Bible when we come in a meeting. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 tells us to preach the word of God. That's why we stand here and we open God's word and we preach it. It's because God in the Bible tells us to do so. The Bible tells us to pray, to baptise and to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And the thing that differentiates, differentiates our worship from the world is that it's done in spirit and truth. It's unseen, it's according to the word of God. It's not done with symbols or pictures or a procession or bells and smells. You see, our worship is done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and he wants us to worship in spirit and in truth. It's between ourselves as individuals, but corporately between us and God. It's something unseen. Now, although the Bible tells us to do these things, it doesn't tell us how long the sermon's to be, how long the prayers are to be, or how, how, uh, how often we're to pray. But the Bible does tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40 that all things are to be done decently and in order. Now, when we come together to read God's word, to pray, to sing, to confess our sins, to baptise, and to celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're doing what the, Lord's, the Lord commands. Now, it's obvious in this time, this lockdown time, that we can't do everything that the Lord commands. All right? We can't do it. But once lockdown, lockdown is eased, once they say, right, ten of you can meet together, we'll meet together. All right? Once it says, right, go for it, we'll get together and we'll sing and we'll definitely celebrate the Lord's Supper. Now, I know some of you have requested that we celebrate the Lord's Supper in our homes and online. It's obvious something that we are all missing. We know it's a means of grace. It's a great blessing to us, isn't it? But why haven't we done it? Why haven't we done it online? Why haven't we said, right, let's go ahead, let's go and do it? Well, it's because when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul makes it very clear that the Lord's Supper is something we do when we come together. It's a communal meal. It's not to be done on satellite or in the privacy of our own homes. It's a meal we do together and we do it publicly. We also read that when Jesus inaugurated the Lord's Supper, he did it with his disciples. He did it when they were together. Now, another thing that we learn from these verses at the end of chapter 39 is that the people avoided what we call pick and choose obedience. Now, we're all familiar with pick and choose obedience. All right. It's our Sinful nature just, just, that just loves to pick the easy things and forget the hard things. All right. The Israelites didn't do that. Right. When Aholiab didn't say, right, well, I, or Bezaliel didn't say, right, well, I'm not going to build the ark because I don't like that piece of furniture. They built it as unto the Lord, for the Lord. The Israelites couldn't be accused of pick and choose obedience. And that's how God, this is a reminder, this is how God wants us to live our lives. He wants us to be subject to him in everything, everything, at work, at school, in the home. If we're successful, you know, God does grant success to people, but he also wants us to be humble. 
Not to go around boasting about our success. It's to remember it's God who gives us that success. And we look to him with gratitude. If we're suffering, you know, if we are suffering and we do suffer, he wants us not to get angry or bitter or even grumble. You know, when things aren't going right, the, our knee-jerk reaction is to grumble. Do you know, God doesn't want us to grumble. He wants us to be thankful in all things. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't go to God and say, this is hard. Help me, give me the grace. But he loves his children to be thankful. He loves us to praise him, to recognize that his hand is in this difficulty. Another thing that we learn from this, uh, from this passage is that worship is an integral part of creation. And that creation and worship come together. And we know that because of verse 43. In verse 43 we read this. Moses inspected the work and saw that, that, that they had done it just as the Lord had commanded. So Moses blessed them. Now verse 43 echoes what God said at creation. It follows the same pattern of some of the words we read in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Now if a Jew here heard verse 43 being read, they would have immediately made the link with Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. But in English, you can't see, it's, it's a little difficult to see, but in Hebrew for a Jew who had a knowledge, an understanding of the Old Testament, particularly Genesis, they would have noticed it. And what was it they would have noticed? Well, they would have noticed that after the third day when God had made the dry land and the sea and all the vegetation to go on that land, when he made all the plants and the trees and the shrubs, well, it must have been a fascinating day that first day, day three. Because after day three, when God had finished, he inspects, all right, he inspects what he's done and he says it was good. God had created all the vegetation how he wanted it to be created. He spoke the word at his command it was implemented. His creation met the standard. It was how he said it should be. And it was good. He looks upon it and says it's good. And then on the fourth day God made the sun and the moon to give, the, uh, to give us the sense of time. One to govern the day and one to, to govern the night. How would we have reacted if we'd have made the moon or the sun? But God made it. His reaction was, they're very good. They're good. They'd be made perfect. I couldn't have made them. God's saying to more or less saying to himself, I say this with reverence. I couldn't have made them any better. They were made according to my word, according to my command. And then on the fifth day we read in verse 20 of Genesis chapter 1. God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to, to its kind. And then we have that phrase again. God looks on what he's made and saw that it was good. It was just as he had commanded. And then in Genesis chapter 1 verse 22 we read something very interesting. Turn to it. Have a look. Test. Have a look. We're told that after he had said it was good in verse 21 we read this. God blessed the sea creatures and the birds, and said, Be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. Did we catch it? Did we see it? God blesses his creation. He gives his blessing. He gives his approval on what he has made. And then at the end of Genesis chapter 1, after the sixth day, we read that God says something more about creation. He says it was very good. It's no longer just good, it's very good. It's marvellous in his eyes. 
He's pleased with what he's made. It's just as he instructed. And then at the start of chapter 3 we read this. On the seventh day God finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Verse 3. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now let's go back to Exodus chapter 39 and that last verse. What does Moses do after he's seen that, that these people have done all that's been commanded? God has issued his decree. God has given his commands to Moses and they've implemented them. God is obviously pleased with what they've done. But then we read that Moses blesses them. It's exactly the same pattern as what we have in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Moses, as God's representative, gives them his approvals, tells them God approves of what they've done. Do you know, God approves, delights, when we obey his commands. Can we see the parallel here in building the tabernacle with creation? Creation follows God's command and the people follow God's command. God best blesses his creation and Moses as God repre God's representative blesses the people. And this is a reminder, isn't it, of why God has created us. He's created us as new, a new creation. He's put his spirit in us. He's given us a new heart and a new nature. Why? To worship him. It's an integral part of our lives when we go to work, when we're serving at the kitchen sink, when we're cooking that meal for the family. It's part of our Christian worship. It's an integral part of our lives. Now there's another parallel between worship in the tabernacle and creation. We haven't touched upon it, but we, we touched upon it in previous weeks. Who was brooding over creation? It was the Holy Spirit, wasn't it, boys and girls? The Holy Spirit was there. Who was brooding over the building of the tabernacle? Who was there? Who was in the background making it all happen? Well, it was the Holy Spirit. He had given these men, these, these women, special skills to build the tabernacle. The Holy Spirit was active on both occasions. This activity of creation and building the tabernacle and also for ourselves in worshipping the Lord involves God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. God had given the commands. The tent, the tabernacle pointed to Jesus. It all happened because of the Holy Spirit. Why are we Christians? Why are we Christians? It's because the Father, God the Father, has looked upon us with favour, just like he did with Enoch and Abraham. He's looked upon us with a special grace. And we're his because of what Jesus Christ has done. It's all on him. It's all because of what he has done. And all that they've done means something to us in our lives because of the work, the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. You know, as Christians, we believe in the triune God and they've been active so that we may know that we're saved from our sins. May you give God praise. May we all give God thanks. Because God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit is active in our lives so that we worship him. May God give us that grace to be true worshippers of God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, every time we worship ourselves or we worship something other than you, we're not worshipping you, Lord. Forgive us, Father in heaven. May we delight in you. May our greatest joy in life be yourself. May this day, Lord, be a delight to our souls. 
May we use it, Lord, for the extension of your kingdom in our own hearts. Be gracious, Father, we need you. We need food, manna from heaven. May we be known like these people, these children of Israel, who did everything you commanded. Lord, help us, we pray, by the power of your Holy Spirit, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.